um, this session at the Natchitoches NSU Folk Festival is going to be uh, talks about preserving material culture in the Delta. And we, if you don't know, the National Parks considers the Delta goes all the way up to Arkansas. So we can incorporate all of these folks who are from such different areas into that whole um, Delta Material Culture um, Association. So we're going to, I'm going to introduce these folks, by the way, I'm Sheila Richmond, and uh, I'm moderating the sessions, and I'm going to ask, if you ask a question, I'm going to repeat it so that they can record it. Uh, if you can't hear what's going on, ask us to speak up. And if you have a question, this is going to be very informal, just raise your hand and, you know, we'll try to get answers for you. Okay, the people on our panel today are Ken Ray from Baton Rouge, Mike Snowden from Atlanta, Atlanta, Lorianne Chasson from the Homa Tribe, Homa Tribe, and uh, Gerard Antoine Dupuis, Dupuis from uh, Montclair, Montclair, <laughs> Voiles Parish, near Marksville. Oh. Near Marksville, yeah. Okay, so we're going to get started with the first on my right, and that would be Ken Ray. Could you tell us a little bit about what you do and how you got started? Okay, my name is Ken Ray, actually from Zachary, which is north of Baton Rouge. I'm a custom saddle maker. Uh, next year will be my 25th anniversary in my own business. I've uh, been building saddles for 28 years. And I got started as a youngster at home, um, just at my house building, doing leather work, building belts. My dad and mom, horsemen, uh, just interested in that. My dad got me started on the kitchen counter, I guess, building belts. And that turned into working on a repair saddle. Um, then I guess at that stage in my life, I was piddling in the winter time in the house with leather and riding horses and uh, really wanting to be a horse trainer. and. A dear good friend of the family's who was a horse trainer and my dad steered me in the saddle making direction which I guess now I'm glad they did I can do the horse thing on my own as a non-professional so to speak and uh, so the saddle making just went from there I worked for a old man named Mr. Harold Chambers in Denham Springs Louisiana through my high school years and just out I spent two years in uh, San Angelo Texas for piling saddlery. And then in 1993, I started my own shop in Baker, Louisiana. And in 03, I moved it to my home now in Zachary. Um, I keep approximately 60 saddles on order in about two and a half year backlog and build accessories for horse things and all. Um, it's a tough way to make a living working for yourself. It's very up and down and feast or famine. But I love what I do, and um, it's very family-oriented, and although it has a tendency to slow me down, my family's at the shop, and I've got some young ones, a year old and two and a half years old and a seven-year-old, so they play it in the shop, learning the leather work and horses and riding, and my wife helps me with um, promotions of the shop and ads and such as that. Um, but I guess what we're here for is just preserving the heritage, which I know there's a, this whole panel has does something different, which I think is a very good thing and the reason I come to this. Um, generally, I go to big horse venues that may be 10 to 20 days long. And so coming to this one day thing was like, golly, that's quick for me. <laughs> but I, I really want to promote this, especially being from Louisiana and doing, I guess, what we all do. but. Um, the horse industry is a lot of people know it being west of the Sabine but there's a lot of it in this region and a lot of good cowboys and a lot of good horsemen so we we build a, a high-end custom saddle and and um, try to preserve the handmade work and try to get what it's worth for working with your hands there's so much stuff knockoff foreign made un-American stuff these days and um, this being handmade in the deltas, I think, quite a good thing. Thanks. That's great for letting us know all about uh, how you got started, and we may be able to see some of your um, 
what do we call these things? These are, are saddle trees. Saddle That's the trees. base of a saddle. Yeah, we'll, we we'll take a look at those in a little bit. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to Mike Snowden. Hey guys, I'm Mike Snowden, and uh, I grew up in Natchitoches. So uh, my dad taught at Northwestern State University for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> So I was born in Lafayette, but I guess when I was, I don't know, maybe a year or so old, my, my dad got, got the job here, so I grew up here. And I moved to Atlanta in 1989. So I live in Atlanta, and uh, but I always get back to Natchitoches, because my folks are here, and my wife's folks, and my sister, and her brother, and aunts and uncles, and all that stuff, so. But I do something kind of different. I build cigar box guitars, and uh, I ever, I've always played in bands growing up around in, around Natchitoches, and uh, I was in rock bands and played a bunch of music all around. And uh, I moved to Atlanta to go play music, and uh, I had a little success playing in bands and going on tours and you know playing all over. Got to play all over the place, all over the world actually. But uh, the music business is crazy. <laughs> it's, it's just insane. So the last band I was in, we were doing about 250 days out of the year on the road. And uh, I did that for like five or six years and the band broke up, which looking back on it was, a, was great. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. But I took some time off. My wife and I had a, had a daughter and she got to be four, three or four years old and I realized she's never seen me play music. I quit playing music. I took a break from playing music. I was done. I was like, I'm never touch a guitar or a bass or instrument, I'm done. But uh. I mean, if you're a musician, you gotta play. So I started, I bought a drum set, I bought a mandolin, I started just buying all these different instruments and I found a cigar box guitar and I was like, what is that? Like, I've never heard of a cigar box guitar before. So I made one and a buddy saw it and he loved it, so I made another one. And before you know it, I've, I've made a ton of them. I've made about 2,000 of them. And I make them all by hand out of my shop in, uh, in, in Atlanta and out of my basement, of a basement shop. And I sell them all over the world on my website. And come to find out that cigar box guitars are an old, they're an old traditional instrument. They're back, they're from the, uh, from the Depression era where guys, around 1860, cigars were shipped, prior to 1860, they were shipped in big wooden crates. So around 1860, they started taxing them and you had to sell them in smaller boxes. So what are guys gonna do but make, you know, make, make guitars out of old cigar boxes? So I do mine really nice. I do inlay and all the fret work and I make it all by hand. I do it all myself. My wife helps me with all the paperwork and chipping and stuff like that. But the guitars, I pretty much do everything all by hand. And it's, you know, like you said, it's lose a lot of that handmade kind of stuff that you just yeah. don't see anymore, you know? So I'm really proud that I make these by hand and it's, I, I spend, countless hours doing this making these guitars but you know that's it's they're pretty much from this era you know uh, um, Bo Diddley made it he took a cigar box and a, a broomstick and a piece of fence wire and made a cigar box guitar so it goes back all the way old timey thing you know that's that that was lost it was lost you know you think I see my kid and what she listens to and I think about me what I listen when I grew up, I listened to stuff my folks were listening to and older stuff, and I went back to listen to stuff. And, and the kids today, I'm not, I'm not trying to sound old, but they listen to just the new stuff. And I'm like, girl, there's all this stuff you need to listen to, you know? So this, this is kind of preserving things and bringing things back, and it's handmade, and it makes music, and it's cool, and it's fun, and I just love doing it. So. And a lot of people like it. And a lot of people like it. And the, you know, when you're playing cigar box guitar, you can't take it too serious. It's just a fun thing. You can go you smile when you play one. So. Can you strum it a little bit. Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, like could you just strum it a little? So yeah, they work, and I make mine electric, and they play really well. So. Electric. Electric cigar, cigar box, box guitar. guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta modernize it a little bit. So. <laughs> Oh, well, thanks. So now we're going to move you. on to Lorian uh, Chasson. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. I'm, uh, like she said, my name is Lorian Chasson, and I'm a um, member of the United Home Nation in South Louisiana, about five and a half hours uh, south here. And I also sit on our tribal council. We have our governor, and I'm an elected official for my people. I'm also um, most proud that I'm a basket weaver. 
and I, I do a half hitch coil stitch basket and this this is the, the actual basket and it's a uh, it's a lost art to our tribe the last known basket weaver that did this particular stitch was my great great grandmother and then John Connery from the uh, museum National Mu uh, Denver Museum uh, in Colorado came down to our tribal office and actually had a class to reteach our people how to do this particular stitch and I wasn't able to make it that day but Janie Luster made it that day and then so she came I, we, there was three ladies that said okay we'll pay you to come and teach us because we missed the class so we did I cooked supper and she came over we paid her to come in and to teach us at my house and so we picked it up and from that day on, um, I mastered it, and I'm teaching the young people. Actually, today I was teaching my little cousin. She lives in Pineville, and so she's not around our tribal people a lot. So I, today, she, while the other kids were playing uh, the kids' uh, area, she said, I want you to teach me. And so today I was actually able to teach her how to do the basics and so um, I, I'm very proud of that and I'm proud that I'm able to teach our young kids and in November I just finished up five camps in Louisiana on teen dating violence and bullying and suicide and one of the things that they did they asked when I did my tribe is that they wanted to do basket weaving they wanted to learn how to build palmetto huts and I said okay Y'all all want to do this, but y'all all want the material there with y'all. So I'll make a deal with y'all. During the Thanksgiving holidays, we will go and harvest this palmetto. We're going to go cut the palmetto. And y'all going to learn to strip the palmetto. And then for Christmas, then we'll be able to cut the palmetto, build palmetto huts, build a palmetto hut, and have, the leaves will be ready to be able to weave a basket. And I'll be able to teach y'all. So they're all excited. I did. Uh, I worked with 30 kids for a week with our tribe on culture and, and all that other, what I said earlier. So I'm, I'm really excited to be able to teach that. And, um, and also I do alligator jewelry. Uh, I'm not sure some, I, see, I think I've seen y'all guys pass by my booth. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and the earrings I have on is alligator. Um, that's, it's something I used to skin alligator, and one of the part of the alligator that you throw away is the back part. There's no use for it. And so I was trying to figure out what to do with the material. And I know a lot of people in our tribe does a lot of alligator uh, garfish jewelry. That's a very common jewelry among our people. So I was trying to clean it like, uh, like garfish, but it didn't work. So about two years of playing with it, I figured it out how to take the pieces off the back of the alligator. So now I work with the local farmers. Instead of them throwing that part away, they'll contact me after they get 300 when it's skinning time, and I'll go get them. And I still skin alligator during uh, hunting season. <laughs> That's another way to preserve culture also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and my babies, they feed the alligators. I, where I live at, I have a bayou in front of my house, and uh, there's never no old food in my house when the kids are around, because they always feed in the alligators. <laughs> but anyway, that's my story. Thanks. And, uh, uh, okay, now we're going to move on to Mr. Uh, Gerard Dupuy, and tell us about what you do, All right. and how you got started. Okay. Euh, mon nom est Gérard Antoine Dupuis, un résident de la paroisse de Zaboyel. Uh, uh, as I get older, uh, talking French gets more and more uh, rare, and our, our people, our young people, uh, need to catch it on. Coda Field is making, is making efforts to try to preserve our language. Uh, the young people need to catch it, uh, and if they don't, well, the language will die. It's in that state. Music is carrying it on a lot. Uh, a lot of young people through uh, performers like well, Steve Rod and Wayne Toops and all that, they, they catch on to, to our language a little bit. Uh, 
but as far as using it in everyday conversation, it's very hard and it takes a, a lot of courage to do it when nobody else talks it around you. And you know language is communication. So so anyway, uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, in high school I played in a band. And uh, then uh, later on, I'll tell you what, I'd come to a uh, Natchitoches festival. I believe it back, might have been back in the 70s or something. And Dewey Balfa was playing over here. He impressed me a lot. Uh, and I started, I started with that. Uh, Mr. Elie Clerget bought a house. He was a sweet potato farmer from Sunset, Louisiana. <laughs> Had moved to the Vols Prairie because the sweet potato land was full of weevils. And so uh, he had a truck, I know, he had an old truck, and, and uh, everywhere he'd go, he had his crates of sweet potatoes, and he had a little loudspeaker, and he had the Cajun music on, you know. And I said, man, man, I, I love that music. And we had, we had our Cajun French radio station, uh, KAPB in Marksville. They, they do the news in French every afternoon, in the morning and in the afternoon. Uh, and, uh, well, the, the language, the language persists in older people in a Vols Parish. We, you got to want to come to Vols Parish. Well, now the casino has popularized it, but before you'd have to want to come there to go because we have no four-lane roads leading there except a little part by uh, I-49. It seems like uh, big cities gobble up culture. Big cities uh, uh, spread the culture thin, uh, new people, all that, and communication. Uh, so they gobble up uh, uh, identity, community identity. We have a strong community center uh, in Montclaw. We're starting up one through, through the area in the parishes. Bartlonville has a strong one, and, and a lot of others. We have a lot of festivals over there, too. And, uh, so, but anyway, uh, so I got started, I got started in Cajun music. And then uh, I worked at Angola at the penitentiary. I retired from there. I was a, a, I was a, a Votet instructor. And uh, I, I taught for 24 years. I even uh, uh, was doing a little bit on death row. And uh, I started started playing it. Uh, like I said, you Balfour was, was a big a big influence in my life in, in Cajun music. And also, my father and his, his daddy played played music, played Cajun music, and uh, French French songs, French fiddlers were in my my ancestry. Uh, so anyway, I started playing and. Uh, I got my old stump there. I, I, I'm small in stature. Some of my band members were all taller than me. So I said, I, dog it, I can't be showed up. You know, a musician, you gotta make a show. <laughs> I said, I said, I said, man, I ain't got you. So I said, I got me this old stump. <laughs> I, I, he said, you get by the microphone. I got me old stump there. And, uh, it was on the boundary line of my land, and I cut it down. And uh, uh, it was old sycamore, because sycamore don't split, uh, like uh, other piece of wood when they dry up. So I did, I did a work on that. I put my, my shiko uh, and my stump, and uh, I go place everywhere I go, just about I bring this. In fact, if I don't have that, people ask for it. So I've been, I've been playing uh, maybe 25 years, something like that. I've been to, to Europe. Uh, 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 played around over there. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. And then uh, uh, around our area, I played that too. Played Cajun music. Right now, I'm enjoying life. Working on my cabin on Larto Lake. And uh, as well as my, my houses back where I, I, I do a lot of old house. Uh, 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 I, I try to repair them like they were, you know. Uh, build chimney. I built my own chimney for my cabin. My, my old uh, great uncle, he'd do the mud chimneys. So you, you can see that 
he's working a lot with um, the culture in his area, trying to preserve the culture um, with the music, with the language, with the architecture. Um, I think also with the hunting and fishing, although you haven't said much about that. So yeah, there are both, all kinds of ways to you know. preserve the culture. And in a nursing home, uh, we, we got a lot of us are Catholic in our parish, being French, and uh, we do the rosaries in French, the prayers, and it soothes the, the old timers. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Mr. Ray, could we ask you to uh, show us a, these um, trees that you have here and tell us why they're different or how they're different? I have two different saddle trees here. Uh, this first one I'm going to show you here is a wood, which is actually, and I'm not totally sure of the type of pine it is, but it's a pine wood covered in rawhide, which is very traditional uh, for years and years, uh, hundreds of years. I still build on some of them today, not as much. This is actually a wood wrapped in Kevlar. So the old rawhide tree in a drier climate, the western climate, still serves its purpose plenty well. In our country, in the marsh and the humidity, you get a lot of ranchers down south um, are in the water getting cattle out of the swamp and swimming horses and and that saddle gets soaking wet in the rawhide and, it, and it's, well, rawhide is very weak when it's wet. Uh, just about don't have nothing to it. But it don't never dry out. I say never. It takes a long time to dry out. So then it, in return that weakens it. So if you swim your horse to the island, go catch some cattle off the island, uh, get caught in the rain or whatever, and then you go rope a cow in it, then you look at breaking your tree. So this Kevlar is pretty new to the saddle making world, but what it enables me to do is I don't actually build the tree, but I have my own design. And I come from the cutting horse show world mostly. So when you're showing horses, you really want a close fit feel to your horse and not real wide. Because when you show a cutting horse, you can't rein them with your hand. You're using your leg and he's working the cow. So you want a feel for your horse, thinner leather, lighter weight tree, close to your horse. So everybody likes that feel, but when you talk about going to the ranching and working cattle, and um, you need a little more strength. So the Kevlar enables me to have a thinner made tree and the strength where a cowboy can go out in the pasture and gather cattle and, and doctor cattle and not worry about breaking it. So this old traditional rawhide tree, you always would nail a uh, galvanized piece of sheet metal in here called a strainer. And the Kevlar tree has a fiberglass strainer made in it with the Kevlar over it, which in return makes it um, stronger. So coming from the arena world, you can, guys roping cattle, showing horses, has the strength and a feel to use a saddle inside the arena or outside in a pasture on a job on a ranch is the difference here on the saddle trees. Okay. Now, uh, did you catch all of that? He's making saddles. He's making leather work. But he's also preserving culture in cattle roping, I mean, actual cattle work, cowboy work, mm -hmm. and also in um, show horse work and that kind of thing. So it's never one thing that you're preserving culture it always just spreads mm -hmm. and as long as you're teaching that to your kids we're in good shape mm -hmm. wow. now mike tell us about um what kinds of songs do you get to play on this now he's told us that there's some updates on saddles it's no longer you know rawhide and so forth kevlar and all of that what do you do on here we know it's a cigar box but what do you do that kind of gives it a little specialness you know, one, one thing I do is uh, the wood I use. Um, last a couple of years ago, I was in town, and I, 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 I've been wanting to make one out of pecan wood. Think about all the pecan trees in Louisiana. 
So I had my father-in-law, I said, man, and you can't go to the store and buy pecan wood anywhere. You try it. <laughs> it's not going to happen. You can't go to you know, Home Depot or Lowe's and say, hey, where's your pecan wood? They'll look at you like you're crazy. But I, I, my father-in-law was like, I have a, I know a guy that owns a mill in Powhatan, and he probably got some pecan wood. So long story short, we jump in the truck, we go out there, and uh, lo and behold, he had some pecan wood that he had air-dried for seven years in his barn. And he gave it to me. Oh, nice. I know. I was like, we're going to buy some from him, you know? And he's like, no, man, you're going to make some guitars out of it? It's like, yeah, I want to do some pecan wood fretboards. And this one, this has walnut on it, mm -hmm. but I have some in the on, in display on there with pecan wood. But, man, it makes a beautiful fretboard. And there was a pecan wood tree. I grew up on Pecan Park, you know, mm -hmm. right here in Natchitoches. And we had pecan trees in our yard. And how cool is it to have a guitar made out of pecan wood from Louisiana, you know? From your area. From your area. Yeah. So it, that's, you know, so that's one thing, you know, the, the wood and the things that people make out of cypress knees and pecan wood and the, what's local to the areas yeah. to me is really cool. It's and this, this box is actually a, it's got a Florida Lee on it. It's a mm -hmm. new, I was in the French Quarter last year. And they have, this is a cigar factory in New Orleans. Let the good times roll, get it? <laughs> so I have, a, I have a box from New Orleans, I have some wood from Louisiana, and even my little logo has a Florida Lee on it, you know, mm -hmm. for, for the back of them. So it's got a little Louisiana in it, you know. So you, you, know. Play, you play music that, goes, that can go far back. Onto exactly. I started out playing, music. you know, hard rock and that kind of stuff. And as I grow, grew older, I started playing, getting into blues and, you know stuff like that and, and you, you, just, you know you don't realize but that's you can't go wrong with that mm -hmm. and, you know? and the people that you sell these guitars to um they're playing all kinds of music also. all kinds of music oh. mm -hmm. some people i sell them to you know some few people I bought them and it's, it's like artwork i love this artwork i'm just gonna hang it on the wall i'm like would you walk by and strum it a little bit <laughs> <laughs> gotta do all that work and it's just gonna hang on the wall. <laughs> they look cool on the wall, but you know, you gotta give it a little strong. It you know. needs a sound. And, yeah, you gotta play it. All right, I'll strum on it every now and then. Can you give us so. like uh, 30 seconds? Yeah. Great, thank you. And I play with the slides. That's a that's an old bluesy thing. Mm -hmm. They just sound real good with the slides. It does. So, yeah. 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 So they're fun. It's fun. It's wonderful. Now, Lorian, you talked about basket making. What and uh, making the jewelry from the alligators, and you can't stop with that because you you do you clean the alligators, you do the skins. <laughs> Are you passing those traditions down also? Oh, uh, I teach a few of my cousins how to, uh, male cousins, how to do alligator. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I like to emphasize that. Uh -huh. <laughs> Actually, her dad, uh, he called me up and he says, look, he says, we got some tags. He said, uh, but want to keep some for me. I said, okay. And he, you know, what you want me to do? I'm way, I'm four hours south of you. Uh -huh. And he says, well, come teach me. I was like, really? You want me to drop everything and drive four hours? So I did. And I came in and um, cleaned that alligator and, and showed him. And I said, well, let's make an alligator sauce pecan at the same time. So mm -hmm. that's what we did. So there you yeah. go. Cooking <laughs> traditions, too. Yes, so it I all do. ties in. Yes, yeah. yes ma'am. And I love that idea that you you getting the kids to go out and harvest. Oh, yes. Harvest mm -hmm. and know how to dry and know right. how to split and know right. how to do that. So. And I also want to tell the, you know, teach them that, um, you know, we, unfortunately we have like cypress baskets. That's something that we can't do any longer, even though there's, I know how, and maybe four or five others know how to do cypress basket, but we can't harvest the cypress any longer because of the coastal erosion in my area. Exactly. So it's a lost art. And mm -hmm. so uh, I'm very fortunate and blessed to have several of my great grandpa's cypress baskets. And 
we do, um, we also do, the most common stitch of our tribe is a jigsaw weave, the four and the seven strand uh, weave. Mm -hmm. And we also do cattail basket, which is... Oh, yes. okay. Yes, it's only... That's a, different. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So we had an um, exhibit at the New Orleans Museum of Art, and I didn't realize the collection I had from our tribe. And I had probably 75% of the collection wow. that I have. I mean, I have baskets everywhere in my house, every <laughs> single room. And every, each one is special. Every one is special. <laughs> and I collect baskets from other tribes because I travel mm -hmm. a lot. So mm -hmm. I collect baskets. That's but, uh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now, Mr. Dupuy, we're going to ask you if you wouldn't mind. What? Getting on your stump uh. and give us a little bit <laughs> before yeah. we have to close yeah. this session. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is on, right? Yeah. Oh, my, my. Well, well, first of thing that, uh, it, it, it's about the blues and uh, why blues persist. And uh, it's because people always go through rough times when you break up with your lid and something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you hit for all the time. <laughs> That's about takes up our time. We want to thank everybody who was here. And don't forget, we're still out at the festival. And I'm sure you can find out where to find all of these people if you have more questions. So thank you for being here.